Welcome to today's session, where we aim to delve deep into a lumbar spine MRI case study and hands-on demonstration of C-arm guided interventional procedure accordingly. Our focus will be pinpointing the pain generator amidst multiple pathological levels in the lumbar spine and discussing reasonable interventional procedures. Key Areas of Focus We are specifically focusing on two key areas of pathology, L4-5 and L5-S1. We aim to identify which levels are the primary generator of the patient's pain and discuss appropriate intervention strategies. Meet my patient. We have a 52-year-old female patient experiencing bilateral gluteal pain, anterior thigh discomfort, and nocturnal calf pain. Although she has had lower back pain for around four years, the pain recently worsened two weeks ago. Importantly, she didn't feel the need to consult a pain doctor for her back pain during those four years, suggesting it was not severe. Also, it's worth noting that the areas of pain she's currently experiencing seem to differ from what she experienced in the past. But before we proceed further with the patient's profile and pain map, please be aware that the initial pain drawing was completed by my assistant, who may need to be fully trained to capture the medical nuances. Keep this in mind as we proceed but it is also a good way to train and interpreting skills. The patient's journey. The pain our patient experiences started worsening two weeks ago. Initially, she felt swelling in both knees, extending to the anterior thigh, gluteal, and calf areas. Interestingly, she started taking aerobic dance classes around this time. However, unexplained soreness in both calves is particularly noticeable during nighttime, not intermittent claudication. In her quest for relief, she visited a hybrid hospital combining oriental and western medical practices. An X-ray indicated spinal stenosis at the L4-5 level. She underwent acupuncture treatment, which was supposed to widen the narrowed spinal canal. Anyway, she felt the pain of VAS of 5 to 6 when she visited me, better than the first attack, whether the acupuncture worked or time worked. Rest and time are critical factors in relieving the pain. As a pain doctor, understanding the pain generators, progression, and mechanism of relieving the pain are more important subjects than just relieving the pain. Let's start with a simple X-ray. Preliminary assessments from a simple X-ray reveal ismic spondylolisthesis at the L4-5 level and mild disc space narrowing with a spur at L5-S1. Dynamic flexion and extension view show mild instability and vacuum phenomenon in the L4-5 disc space, brainstorming. There are critical tips from history. Our patient has been dealing with low-grade back pain for about four years. She recently took aerobic dance classes and noted that her symptoms acutely worsened. She reports pain in her gluteal region, calf, and anterior thigh and brief discomfort in her knees these symptoms weren't a closer look. Clarifications from detailed history. While many pain specialists might initially assume that simultaneous gluteal and calf pain points to central stenosis or radicular pain, delving deeper into this patient's history reveals a more nuanced situation. First, calf pain. The pain she experiences is diffuse, not localized, suggesting it may not be radicular in pain nature. She reports no claudication but has discomfort that predominantly appears at night. She revealed marks on her skin indicating lower extremity venous insufficiency, which suggests that the calf pain might be separate from any spinal issues but more suggestive of venous congestion. Second, anterior thigh pain. Furthermore, her anterior thigh discomfort may very well be exercise-related, owing to her recent involvement in aerobic dance. Notably, she reported a reduction in her symptoms when she took a break from her aerobic dance classes for two weeks. Thus, we could consider excluding this from being lumbar origin pain. To exclude the anterior thigh pain from the lumbar origin, I am particularly interested in looking for disc herniation at the L3-4 or L4-5 levels that could be compressing the L3 or L4 segmental nerve roots. Typically, Patients with ismic spondylolisthesis rarely complain of radicular pain unless associated with acute disc herniation or severe anterior spondylolisthesis affecting nerve roots. Third, gluteal pain. 
I aim to isolate the cause of her gluteal pain from the lumbar spinal origin. Fourth, underlying low-grade chronic back pain, the pain may be attributed to the ongoing transition from instability to the stabilization phase in her L45 ismic spondylolisthesis. Let's observe that the MRI provides a more nuanced picture, allowing us to pinpoint which level could cause the patient's gluteal pain. Starting with the findings at the L45 level, the sagittal T2 in phase image shows an anterior displacement of L4 on L5, accompanied by subchondral high signal intensity and a wide anteroposterior diameter without disc protrusion. Axial T2 weighted images show a wide AP diameter at L4-5 and a defect in the pars interarticularis at L4. In addition, the Dixon water image reveals low signal intensity at the adjacent subchondral bone of L4-5. At the same time, the Dixon fat image indicates very high signal intensity at the same subchondral bone. Also, the oblique sagittal image shows moderate foraminal stenosis on both sides of L45. The clinical impression from these MRI findings suggests ismic spondylolisthesis with modic type 3 changes, indicating a stabilization phase, thereby making it less likely to cause referred pain or nerve root compression. Moving on to the L5-S1 level findings, the Dixon water image shows high signal intensity at the subchondral bone, and there is evidence of soft disc central protrusion. Axial T2 we confirms this central protrusion of the soft disc at L5-S1. The oblique sagittal image also shows moderate foraminal stenosis at both L5-S1. The clinical impression here points to ongoing instability, represented by modic type 1 changes, discitis, and a protruding soft disc. These findings raise two key possibilities, first, that the instability and pain could be referred from discogenic origins or subchondral bone marrow, and second, that there could be bilateral nerve root compression. Given these comprehensive findings, our interventional strategy will primarily focus on L5-S1. A bilateral L5 infraneural approach is planned, specifically targeting the disc space to reduce inflammation in both the disc and the subchondral bone. However, caution will be exercised with the volume of infiltrate used when I target intradiscal space. Still, intradiscal direct injection is the second option, and an excessive amount could worsen the existing soft disc protrusion in that case. So, I will use an infraneural approach of transferaminal injection without intradiscal injection. See arm guided infraneural approach. Our next segment will feature a step by step video demonstration detailing the procedure of the infraneural approach of both L5. We need a more steep cranial tilt of the C arm to approach the L5 transferaminal injection. After observing the transverse process of left L5, I will rotate the C arm to the left ipsilateral side. Let's watch the cinematic display of C arm images needle manipulation, and the injection process, all while adjusting the C-arm's rotation and tilt. I initially approach with the needle held by long forceps. My target is the lateral corner between the superior articular process of S1 and the upper border of sacral ala. To control the placenta forceps, sometimes I hold the forceps with two hands or assist the needle with the other hand. Once the needle path stabilizes, I hold it with my bare hand for better tactile feedback. You'll watch alternating between C-arm and needle views throughout the procedure to follow each step closely. If you feel your needle passes the intertransverse ligament or passes the lateral wall of the superior articular process, return the C-arm to a neutral AP view. Then, Compare the needle tip and lateral border of the articular process again. The needle should pass the bone in an oblique view and AP view. To inject the contrast media, I use an extended mini-volume tube. This measure minimizes radiation exposure to my hand. Upon injecting the contrast, I observed it spreading the upper border of the S1 pedicle and retrodiscal epidural space. It looks good, therefore, thereby I will infiltrate the steroid mixture. I usually use botulinum toxin in discogenic pain. 
At this time, I use 50 units of Botox in total. Then, I will move on to the right L5 infraneural approach. When there is a foraminal stenosis, I prefer the infraneural approach over the subpedicular one because the contrast spreads to the foraminal space and remains more in the foraminal space. I will approach the needle in the same way. Enjoy the show! I rotated the C-arm more to visualize the contralateral oblique view. In the contralateral oblique view, I turned the C-arm to measure the depth precisely, not to violate the disc space. The needle should stay out of the imaginary line of the disc. Thank you for your attention. Stay tuned for our next segment, where we will offer a detailed, step-by-step -step walkthrough of the infraneural approach in different cases.